first person that I don't know gave me the inner strength that I needed uh, to overcome or to be able to think about overcoming the tremendous odds that I were against me was my grandmother. Uh, she came from uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, to see me, to see me at Yardville Prison. Uh, I was in uh, that prison. Uh, I was put in a, a maximum security unit um, in a cell with two guards in front of the cell 24 hours a day and the cell between two gun towers that could train their guns directly on the cell. Uh, I was told that I was in the Yardville a unit for women, even though I was the only woman, uh, and they uh, tried to keep me there for the rest of my life. Um, my grandmother came to visit me there to tell me a dream. And she came with all of my family and everybody was happy. And I'm like, you know, what's happening with you? You're in this mood. She had a dream. She had a dream. And I was like, okay, okay. And so my grandmother's dream was that she was dressing me, that she was in an old house that she lived in when she lived in New York still. Uh, and she was putting clothes on me. I said, is that the dream? She said, that's the dream. And I said, well, was I little or big? She said, no, you were big. So I said, oh my God, the only time people dress anybody when they're grown is when they're dead. And so she said, no, 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 I know what you're thinking. No, no, no. What this dream means is that you are going to leave this prison. I don't know when, but it's going to be much less time that you than you've already spent here. And, you know, I didn't understand the dream, to be honest. It didn't make any sense to me. What does this have and wearing clothes have to do with getting out of prison? But my grandmother has always had dreams, and her dreams have always come true. I don't know how my mother walked her trouble down. Many people say that injustice and hunger are walking freely all over the universe and that nature is seeking a response. Once asked the earth, where are the women worms? The earth responded, they have been scattered all over the world, but they can always be identified by the beauty in their eyes, which reflects the dignity and the greatness of the rainbow. Nevertheless, continued the earth, they suffer greatly, often much more than what is commonly endured by human beings. Why? 
Then the moon and the sun responded energetically. We have to look for them. We have to bring them together. Because it is only women warriors who know how to survive in the midst of so much suffering, struggling, struggling, struggling. I come from uh, a tradition of, of women maroons, cimarrones, who uh, didn't just try to escape from oppression, but were totally mind, body, spirit committed to uh, resisting and committed to winning, whether it was Nanny in Jamaica, who fought uh, against uh, the enslavers, whether it was Harriet Tubman who helped to free uh, more than 700 slaves. I think I come from a, a very strong history and I simply want to live on this planet and to continue that tradition and to try in my little way to make my ancestors proud. I want to live in, in, in a country where, uh, where freedom means something. know what to expect it you know I had these like crazy images because even though I was I considered myself a socialist I considered myself someone who really identified with the Cuban Revolution I had been raised on a diet of anti-communism and so I came here and I you know I was like expecting first of all everybody to look like Fidel I thought everybody was going to wear green fatigues and stuff. It was just like a crazy thing. And I thought people would be talking like the revolution. You know what I mean? I just had these crazy stereotypes. And then when I came, it was just, it was like, wow, a whole new world. Um, the first thing that hit me was, you know, just how beautiful the n nature is here. You know, whether it's the sea, whether it's the plants. Um, this is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life. Everything is so lush, so green, so ripe. And, you know, just the climate made me immediately feel at home. I was very much impressed by the healthcare system, by the education system, by the sports teams, by all of the many uh, things that the revolution has been able to accomplish. What has impressed me most has been how people live, just how people relate to each other. I mean, I come from a society that is literally at war with itself. Um, I didn't even know how to react to people when I came here. People would just come off the street and talk, start talking to me and I would immediately get paranoid where they want what you know it was very difficult for me to realize you know somebody would say you know what time is it or uh, where did you buy that because Cubans will come up to you and just talk to you you know whether you were in a store or a line and that was something very different that human contact <laughs> Oh, 
New York, in Jamaica, Queens, um, and I stayed there uh, until I was about three or something, and I went with my grandparents to live in Wilmington, North Carolina. My grandparents uh, decided to go back to Wilmington because Wilmington uh, was their home. And because also they wanted to open up a small business. They had saved all their money um, hoping to go back to Wilmington and they did go back and they opened up a small business on the beach by the sea. Uh, it, they opened the business uh, because uh, at that time Wilmington was completely segregated. Well, this, the South was just totally segregated. It was a, apartheid. Um, what that meant was that um, there were black schools, for example, I went to a all-black school, the Gregory School. Uh, there were the black library. You know, we grew up with that kind of reality of uh, not voluntarily uh, living like that, not voluntarily accepting apartheid, but understanding that the price of uh, stepping out and or standing up alone could possibly be death. And from slavery, the idea of political prisoners started. We were political prisoners brought here from Africa. We were political prisoners in the... Um, uh, in order to keep colonialism fat, in order to keep the plantation owners that profited from our sweat and labors, we were kidnapped and brought here as prisoners. And our status hasn't changed whether um, it's on the streets, we're prisoners of the ghettos uh, of ha in Harlem, we're prisoners um, in small tenements with prisoners of urine smelling hallways and I mean I've always been a prisoner. I was I've never been free in my life. I, I don't I don't know what freedom means. Sitting in this place on on this plantation, you know, you think back to what those slaves had to deal with and that probably the only beauty that they saw was the human beauty between them and the beauty of the sky and of the trees and of the grass. And I think that probably helped them to, to survive, to, to stay alive, to stay alive internally, spiritually. Um, growing up, you know, by the sea and seeing the beauty of this planet. I just, it was hard not to really have a profound respect for this planet, for nature. Uh, my grandmother, she could not stand people throwing paper on the floor. I mean, she could not take that. That was a, a crime for her because what I meant, you know, she would say, look at these grown people, you know, what's wrong with their hands? They can't hold the paper until they find a, a trash can, you know. I think that it, how we live in this earth is very much tied to how we think about nature. And so I think that it's important for African people and all people of, who appreciate living 
to make sure that our children and our grandchildren have a planet that is livable. And that means to make very serious changes in the order of uh, the priorities and the politics that exist today. Being African is not uh, a, uh, a matter of race. It's a matter of a history, of a culture, of a struggle of a people. And the important thing is to be able to remember that, not to be disassociated from that, not to be torn from that, to carry that on. Uh, into the future and to carry that on in changing uh, the future. because the projection is very different. How you are, are taught to think about Cuba in, in the U.S. media. So I was really shocked. And then I began to um, be exposed to the culture, and the culture is so rich, whether it's in dance, whether it's music. It's so African. There's the rhythm, there's the drums, you know. 
I began to be aware of just how much they had robbed us in the, in the United States because the slavery, the kind of slavery that existed here was terrible and equally as terrible in the United States, but people were able to keep their religions, their, their gods, their part piece of the language. Uh, they were able to maintain um, dances, rituals that were directly from Africa. And for the first time in my life, I became acquainted with the Orishas with uh, Yemaya, Shango, Obatala, and I felt like, wow, I was reclaiming just another piece that we was stolen from. Boba ena ye mata que ya na yo They came under uh, the guns of the FBI, as did all of the uh, Black Liberation Movement. It didn't matter what positions you took. It mattered uh, that people related to those positions, that people understood what you were saying, that people supported you. And I think that uh, when J. Edgar Hoover and those who control the United States government understood how many young people uh, looked to the party for leadership, how many young people were inspired by uh, the Black Panther Party, how many young people supported the activities of the Black Panther Party. And it was, you know, people, just ordinary street people who, people, working people, mothers, grandmothers who would come to the office and bring clothes, come to the office and um, make donations. Um, so the, the government just perceived us as a threat because they understood that we were serious, they understood we were telling the truth, and they understood also that we were becoming a much more sophisticated opposition. We were not just the piece of pie opposition, but that we wanted a real structural change in the United States. And so we took very clear positions. We opposed the United States uh, government intervention in Vietnam. We opposed uh, the blockade against Cuba and all of the other U.S. policies that were hostile to the Cuban Revolution. We opposed uh, the United States policies of supporting apartheid in South Africa. Uh, we opposed all of the U.S. government's imperialist policies against all progressive people's struggles. 
by the 1960s, the end of the 1960s, the black liberation movement became the main target of the counterintelligence program. And uh, what they did was to try to neutralize all of our leaders uh, to prevent young people from coming together and uniting. And so what they did is try to pit organization against organization. They tried to pit leaders in the, in the same organizations against each other. In New York, uh, where I was, um, what they did was they arrested in, uh, I think it was 1968, 1967, 1968, I'm not very clear on the date, I don't remember it at this moment. They arrested on charges of conspiracy 21 of our most effective activists, of our, our most effective leaders, as a movement have to concentrate a lot of our energies on trying to liberate our imprisoned comrades. Um, and uh, even though um, they were given bail, the bail was $100,000 a piece. And only a few of them we were able to bail out. I think that we cannot look at the Black Panther Party in the past. We cannot look at the Black Liberation Movement as something in the past. African people are still not free. And there are still many, many political prisoners in the United States. It is time for us to demand total immediate amnesty for all political prisoners and prisoners of war. If we do not uh, take ourselves seriously, if we do not take our movement seriously, then we will have to, to he hang our heads in front of our ancestors. <laughs> Where I was kept uh, for um, in a room, isolated um, for something like four or five days. Uh, I was beaten, tortured. Um, It was uh, a hellish experience. Uh, no one was permitted to see me. Uh, my aunt, who is also my lawyer, Evelyn Williams, had to get a court order for her and my mother and my sister to come and see me. I was in prison altogether six and a half years. I spent two and more than two and a half years in solitary confinement. Uh, much of that was in men's prisons. In other words, I was the only woman. Uh, even though they say that there are no political prisoners in the United States, um, I, I was kept in solitary confinement, kept in men's prisons because of my political beliefs. So you figure that one out. Um, 
what it was prison. Prison was hell. It was a new kind of plantation. I feel like a, I feel like a maroon woman. I feel like an escaped slave because what I, I saw in, in, in the United States in those prisons was slavery. It was black people with chains in cells. It was just poor people, you know, I mean, just stepped on and smashed. I'll never forget what I saw. I'll never forget what I've lived through. I'll never forget what my people have lived through. We started to, I don't know, to feel tender toward each other. We started to feel an attraction, to feel like human beings again, I guess is the word for it. Um, and the subject of sex came up and we thought about it and we talked about it. And um, it was really heavy. It was a heavy, heavy thing because, you know, I didn't know how to feel. Uh, because so much that was around us was like slavery, you know, I mean, it was like very clear they were out to wipe us out. And it was real, it wasn't any fantasy, it wasn't any joke, they were out to take our heads. And, you know, I, I felt like a slave. I'm sure he must have felt just like a slave. And we said, well, how could we even think about bringing a child into this world? But then what other world is there to bring a child in? I mean, the world is a terrible place. And, you know, I thought about my, my mother, my grandmother, my great, great, great grandmothers and what they must have thought about as slaves um, bringing life into this world. And, you know, we just decided that we were going to live, you know, we were going to live, we are going to struggle, uh, and we're not going to kill our own hopes. We're not going to kill our own life. We're not going to kill our right to live. And so we just decided to be human beings, to be people, in spite of all the people that were trying to squash us down and all the forces that were trying to dehumanize us. We decided to be human. <laughs> Dinero 
The day uh, before uh, it was time to escape, I called my grandmother and I couldn't call her, you know, and say, I'm getting ready to escape. And so she said, um, I want to tell you something. Are you listening to me? Yes, grandmother. I don't want you to get used to that place. Don't get accustomed to that place. Do you hear me? Yes, grandmother. Are you sure you hear me? Yes, grandmother. I do not want you getting used to that place. Do you hear me? Yes, grandmother. And so I, when I hung up the phone, it was like a sign. It was like, you know, my grandmother knew. It was like everything was ready to go. And uh, everything went. And everything went fine. I think that the only way that we're going to realize uh, freedom, justice, equality, decent living for people is if there's a complete change, a complete change, everything has, has got to be turned around and that, that's a revolution, a complete change. <laughs> Slavery, people went around looking for their family, looking for the marks that they put on their children. So I'm sure there's a lot about my family's separation and the pain that I don't know whether it's in the coast of Africa or the coast of uh, some island in the Caribbean or in the United States. Uh, separation is a real part of being African. Uh, in the Americas, being slaves or ex-slaves. Uh, in my own case, uh, prison has meant separation, exile has meant separation, and well, I'm gonna be real right now because I, I can't be any other way. Uh, today, uh, my mother died. And I didn't know if I could do this, but since I didn't have anything else to do, and I figured this was the best homage I could pay to my mother, is to try to carry on her tradition, what she passed down to me, what my grandmother passed down to her, and what their fourth mothers passed down to them. I hope that I can live up to my mother's example, and I hope I can live up to my ancestors' expectation of me because I really believe that I have a duty to all those have, who have come before me, to all those who lie at the bottom of the ocean, to all those who lost their lives, whether it's in the cane fields or the cotton fields or you know, hanging off some tree to continue this struggle and to continue to love and to continue to believe and to continue to try to be human, to be giving, to be loving.
others celebrate. It is only they who see the dreadful colors of suffering. It is only they who perceive where the intense splendor of victory is to be found. Because warrior women are the eyes of the women. The eyes of the women. The eyes of the women. My name is Asata Olubala Shakur. Asata means she who struggles. Olubala means for the people. And Shakur means the thankful. It is a name that I took to carry on the name of Zaid Malik Shakur in honor of his family and in honor of the forces of beauty and good on this earth, which I'm very grateful for. That is my name.